The capture of European hostages in Algeria in 2003 was, on the face of it, proof that Al-Qaeda was active in the Sahel. After a battle allegedly with Algerian paratroopers in June that year, some hostages were released. But later, one of the hostages said he believed the battle was staged and suggested that terrorists and soldiers might be linked. Questions were raised about whether El Para was what he seemed, not least because he used to work for Algerian special forces. The human rights organization Algeria Watch conducted an investigation and concluded, A close study of the facts shows that there is no other explanation for this operation than the directing of the hostage taking by the DRS, the Algerian army's secret service. Uh, the leader of the group, who, who was responsible for this, was an agent of the Algerian secret services. And what this enabled, if you like, uh, was, uh, if you like, the convenience for both the Algerian government and the American governments, who both uh, wanted terrorism in that area. Despite serious questions about who was really behind it, the kidnapping was used by both Algeria and the US to justify a new relationship and the resumption of arms sales to Algeria. It has also helped justify a series of operations now run by AFRICOM in which the US provides arms, military support and training to a number of countries in the Pan-Sahel and Maghreb area. Since 2005, the US has spent several hundred million dollars on training North African armies in counter-terrorism. What the Americans can't do is control how or against whom that training is used. Take Niger, for example. The Tuareg have long been a marginalized grouping within Niger, denied a fair share of the uranium riches taken from their lands and repressed by Niger's autocratic president, Mamadou Tanja. In 2007, their resentment turned into open revolt. We're demanding at least 20 to 30 percent of these revenues come back to the people here. President Tanja is not a man to mess with. He recently provoked international condemnation by dissolving the Niger parliament and forcing a referendum on changing the constitution so he could stay in power. It's the kind of behavior which Obama specifically attacked in July 2009 when he praised Africans who defend democracy and fight oppression. Make no mistake, history is on the side of these brave Africans not with those who use coups or change constitutions to stay in power. Yet the United States plans to spend $20 million in 2010 alone on its Trans-Saharan Counter-Terrorism Partnership, effectively an anti-Al-Qaeda training program of which Niger remains a full member. The irony is not lost on the local Tuareg against whom those US-trained troops are likely to be turned. In Paris, we spoke to Ahmed Akol of the Tuareg rebel group, the MNJ, who says local people don't believe this is really about Al-Qaeda at all. Des, des raisons de, 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 de se déployer simplement sur le terrain, mais sinon, quelque part, les États eux-mêmes qui jouent à ce jeu, c'est-à-dire euh, tant le Niger que le Mali, ce qui les intéresse dans, dans cette compétition, eux, c'est l'armement qu'ils peuvent avoir, les Américains. Les armements, ce qui les intéresse, eux, c'est ce déploiement euh, du contrôle du Sahara pour des questions de compétition, des ressources nucléaires euh, ou des ressources pétrolières ou des ressources, euh, en tout cas, énergétiques qui sont aujourd'hui euh, le fondement de toute euh, la compétition qui se fasse qui se fait dans, à travers le monde. You will be aware General Ward that in the post 9/11 world that there are governments out there playing the game if you like in order to 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 get American assistance one way or the other on a threat that actually may not be that big. Well, I, I, again, I can't speak for a government. Uh, and I wouldn't I wouldn't wouldn't even characterize it as a particular this or that. You know you know, violent extremism, regardless of its source, that threatens innocent people, the innocent civilians of a nation, in my mind's eye, is something that a government is obliged to try to bring under control. 
It is the age-old problem, because of course, one man's violent extremist is another man's Tuareg freedom fighter. And for the governments in the region, from Niger to Algeria, the threat of terrorism can be a useful excuse for controlling dissent. All the governments in the region, without exception, have used the war on terror to batten down, if you like, and attack minority groups, civil society organizations in their own countries. And almost inevitably, just as happened in Somalia, repression leads to resentment, to anger, and to revolt. What has happened uh, is that this zone of terror, as the Americans have called it, has become a self-fulfilling prophecy, that the local people, mostly Turing, have been so, if you like, repressed by the local regimes because of, of this uh, presence of alleged presence of terrorism. They've got fed up with it because they've been more oppressed as a result. They have rebelled. And we have really a zone of rebellion, of conflagration, right through uh, northern Niger, northern Mali, which, as we speak, is getting worse. The big question is, will or can the Obama administration make a decisive break from that whole Bush approach to Africa? There has been a subtle change in the language used by the men and women of AFRICOM. You no longer hear them talk about the global war on terror. Instead, what you get is the struggle against violent extremism. But what isn't yet clear is whether this represents a real change in America's outlook and policies, or whether it's just a rebranding of the same products inherited from the Bush era. A very real test of that is now presenting itself in another North African country, Sudan. Sudan is in a bad way. The 2005 peace agreements, which ended the 22-year-long civil war between the North and the South, a war which cost two million lives, is under threat. And to the West, the humanitarian disaster in Darfur shows no sign of ending. But the United States stands accused of failing to act decisively on either of those ongoing crises. And the reason for that is that the so-called war on terror became the overriding foreign policy priority of the Bush administration. And that policy led the US to enter a secret relationship with the very government in Khartoum it had accused of genocide and war crimes. The relationship with Sudan is, uh, is, is really, you could best describe it as bipolar. I, I, the U.S. Congress has passed strong sanctions against Sudan, and there have been condemnations all around of, of uh, Omar Bashir. But around 2006, interestingly enough, uh, the condemnations of Bashir stopped from the Oval Office. President Bush and, uh, and his representatives refused to say anything bad about Bashir. So, why did the US go silent? The answer may be this. On April the 17th, 2005, a CIA jet flew on a secret mission from Khartoum to Washington. On board was a very surprising passenger. His name was Salah Abdullah Ghosh, and he was the head of the feared Sudanese intelligence service, the NIS. Ghosh is a former associate of Osama bin Laden and is today wanted by the International Criminal Court for crimes in Darfur, the same crimes condemned as genocide by President Bush. Abdullah Ghosh, who is the person who uh, the ICC believes um, was the mastermind carrying out the, uh, the atrocities in Darfur. He's also head of the, uh, the intelligence there. In 2005, Gosh was feted around Washington by the CIA, and subsequently there were comments from CIA representatives in Africa uh, suggesting that Sudan was our eyes and ears on Somalia. Sudan was best placed to provide the U.S. intelligence information on what was going on in the continent vis-a-vis al-Qaeda. It was a remarkable piece of political double standards. But perhaps more seriously, it compromised the US's ability to deal with Sudan's other problems. It meant, say the critics, that the US was placing the priorities of the global war on terror above the urgent humanitarian and political needs of the people of Sudan. U.S. officials will try to say that, look, they, they were actually two different relationships and neither uh, interfered with the other. That's 
total garbage. Th that, the war on terror was paramount. That superseded anything else. Our primary, primary policy towards Sudan was to protect that security uh, and intelligence relationship with Sudan on the war on terror. Today, tensions are rising again between the governments of the North and the South. Khartoum is accused of deliberately undermining the peace process. Both sides are accused of rearming. And in the impoverished South, a collapse in oil revenues and rampant corruption are causing chaos. The capital, Juba, is overflowing with people still displaced by the war. The government lacks the resources and the will to help them. This refugee camp, home to a couple of hundred people, was demolished the previous night, but its residents had nowhere to go. The third warning, they came and they degraded, they start demolishing them without even giving them a site, so they don't know what they can do. If the peace agreement fails, Sudan will probably go to war again with catastrophic consequences. So, what can or will President Obama do? Before taking office, he promised a comprehensive strategy for Sudan. Its much-delayed publication is now imminent. And what it contains will be a real test of Obama's intentions. If the war on terror really is over, or at least is no longer the guiding principle of US foreign policy, is Obama really prepared to abandon the intelligence relationship in favor of putting more pressure on Khartoum over both Darfur and implementing the peace agreements with southern Sudan. How Obama deals with that question will, in the eyes of Africa, set a marker for his commitment to development in the continent at large and his commitment to undoing the damage caused by the global war on terror. But there is another test which will be even tougher and that concerns the other foreign policy priority of the Bush administration, the rush to secure oil.